All righty. Um, I'm going to um, first, I want to thank you all for coming in and joining me tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about fall gardening, getting ready for fall gardening. I know it seems like it's just the middle, just summer has just begun, really. Uh, but we have to start thinking ahead. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen to get the um, All righty. I have to just get my, hold on, just bear with me for a second while I, um, oops, I didn't want to do that. Okay, I've kind of lost my, there it is. Okay, I get my, get my chat going here. All right, all right, there we go. Okay. Looking ahead to fall gardening. Okay, what are some of the advantages to fall gardens? Um, it's often better than spring planting for a lot of crops, including cool weather crops. They mature when they mature in cool weather. Uh, their flavor is milder and sweeter. Uh, they it, sometimes crops like. Uh, anywhere from turnips and mustard and things like that are the flavor can get really strong if they're is that go into summer and uh, you avoid that with uh, planting them for fall harvest. Uh, bugs are usually less of a problem. Um, I say usually because sometimes <laughs> bugs are pretty uh, uh, invasive and they, per, they persevere throughout the fall. But usually a lot of them as as we head toward fall are starting to think about laying, you know, burrowing in and overwintering and not so much in the eating and breeding uh, side of things. So um, as we get cooler, cooler weather bugs slow down. Uh, you can expand the harvest from your garden. If you typically plant your garden in the spring or early summer after Memorial Day, you can get a like a, almost a whole different harvest uh, in the fall when a lot of people have just given up on gardening. Um, more rain, uh, that's typically what we have in the fall, not necessarily, and nothing is a given anymore. So you have less watering usually required. Um, it's more pleasant to work outside when it's not so darn hot. <laughs> That's uh, um, one of the benefits, and it's also uh, what makes the plants less less uh, stressed. Um, a lot of people go on vacations during the summer. They're home more in the fall, so they can tend to their gardens a little better. And the last one is actually not the least because this is my big one. If you missed the spring planting season for whatever, people have family emergencies, they go away, they are so busy they just can't get to it or they can't plant the garden they really wanted to plant. Um, you get a whole new opportunity uh, putting in a fall garden. And that's important to me because I'm often super busy in the spring. Um, so again, you know, you're thinking, well, this is still June. Why are we starting to think about it now? Uh, well, you have to gather your supplies and seeds. You have to think about what you're going to plant, plan your, plan the crops that you want to grow. Um, if you're, if you're one to, you know, keep track of things on spreadsheets and stuff, you can get all that ready. Um, plants should be eating size by the first frost. Now this is very important because last year, 
our first frost was um, only a weekend to September, um, a full month, five weeks before our average uh, fall frost. So um, people like me who had sort of plant, planted things thinking I was going to have a whole month more for them to grow before the frost hit were kind of caught, you know, with little tiny plants in the garden. And once they've frozen, they don't usually grow that much more. So it kind of stops their growth. So you've got to count back um, on your calendar for if it's a 55 degree or 55 day plant, you want to count, make sure that you've planted it by the middle of July um, to get it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm timing everything from the beginning of September at this point, you know, a week or two into September. Uh, everything, every week that we don't get a frost past that is just gravy. Um, so lessons learned, you know, even experienced gardeners can get caught um, with, you know, by a early frost. Um, our weather is becoming increasingly unpredictable. As I just mentioned, we really don't we can't count anymore on having our full, um, you know, however many days, 100 to 140 day summer that we used to have. Uh, so, you know, when you're planning for your crops, like I said, I, I've been um, adding a little bit of time onto, so starting them earlier than I normally would have. Um, and in the last year and a half, trust has been shaken in our national supply chain. Uh, we've, you know, a lot of people, I mean, gardening experienced a huge surge in popularity as people realized that, oh my gosh, I might not be able to get go to the store and get food or I won't get all the food I need. So, you know, they, a lot more people turned to gardening. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of people are finding gardening hard because they haven't prepared themselves for it. Uh, they haven't learned as much as they needed to learn. Um, so this is why we're here. We're going to try to help you to, uh, if you're not an experienced gardener, we're going to try to help you to plant a fall garden and still, you can still harvest a lot of food before uh, we're done for the winter. Uh, and this is a seed saving tip for people who do our seed savers. Uh, biennial vegetables, and those are vegetables that flower in their second year. Um, actually, the younger, fresher plants do better overwintering and producing seed the following summer. If you start a kale plant in, say, April or May, and it's been growing all summer and it's huge, and it's a glorious plant, but if it manages to survive the winter, um, you know, it's going to produce seed the next year because it's a biennial. But if it, it it's much more likely to uh, make it through the winter if it's a younger plant. So I've, I've, I've found a, even hard to save seeds like beets. Um, a lot of people act in this climate actually pull their beets up in the winter and store them in refrigeration and then replant them in the spring. But I have found that a young beet that's only a, maybe an inch or two around is going to overwinter much, much better than a giant beet that had kind of reached um, picking size long before the frost hit. So the, one of the things you want to do um, in the next week or two is um, harvest everything that's matured. Uh, look, at, look at what's left. Um, clean them up, take away all spent foliage, um, add some compost to the plants that are going to be staying in the garden for quite a while um, that will stay in the garden after frost. And those are things like Brussels sprouts that typically don't produce until fall, um, leeks, uh, storage carrots, kale, all of the root crops, and even your uh, pole beans uh, that they they tend to, bush beans tend to come in all at once, but pole beans can actually um, stay on it until we actually get a frost. So you, you, they'll keep producing. So um, check your flowers too. 
if your petunias and pansies are have been struggling in the heat over the summer, if you trim them back and give them a little boost with some compost, um, make sure they're getting watered, bachelor buttons, larkspur, they can all be kind of uh, rejuvenated and they'll sometimes reward you with a nice uh, fall flush of flowering. Um, and then if you've got empty spots where you've taken out things that are all done, like your spring, if you're, if you planted lettuce this spring, um, I know in my garden, it's just about done. And then if I'm not going to save seeds, I clean it out. Um, so you, I'm going to have holes in my garden and I have to choose what I'm going to do with them. I'm either going to plant another crop there for food. If I'm not, it's not really great to have your garden, um, languish just in bare soil, you can put a little of what's called a cover crop in. And this is a crop that's, um, you grow that grows quickly and it's intended to be uh, 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 mixed back into the soil uh, so that it actually, add, it's like composting in place. So uh, we'll go into that a little bit more in another slide. Um, so what we have with, uh, I'm going to move something over here, with uh, day length is important to consider when we're doing fall gardens. There's a thing called photoperiodism or the circadian rhythm of plants. We're not going to have a test later. You really don't have to remember that part. But it has to do with how much uninterrupted darkner, darkness plants get rather than sunlight. Um, and we're not exactly close to the equator and even the hardiest plants. And I'm thinking trees, shrubs, you know, things that overwinter all the time, they stop growing after early November when they get less than 10 hours of sunlight. That's why, uh, trees have rings because they grow and then they stop, then they grow and then they stop. Um, so what are called long day plants are plants that um, you seed in the spring and as they approach the longest days of the year, which is the middle of summer, we just passed that a few days ago. Um, those things are, that signals them to set seed and, uh, and basically they're done producing. And those things include lettuce and spinach, cilantro, mustards, Asian greens, turnips, radishes, um, those types of plants um, are now thinking about setting seeds. That's why lettuce bolts and spinach bolts, they send up a flower stalk. Now, on the other hand, cauliflower is the opposite. Cauliflower starts to form ahead as the days get shorter as we move toward fall. Uh, so a lot of people have better luck with cauliflower in the fall. I know a lot of people say, I've given up on cauliflower. I don't plant it anymore. It doesn't form ahead. Um, excuse me here. I've had a let's see what it is. I didn't admit somebody. Um, so um, you know, so if you have always had trouble growing cauliflower, then try to think about starting seeds now to plant um, in the garden in just a few weeks, and you might have a lot better luck. Uh, onions are another example. Uh, we, we tend to plant in our northern latitudes long day onions. As, as the day length lengthens, the bulbs start to form. Um, in the south, they, they don't plant, they plant short day onions because being closer to the equator, they, they, their days are shorter, or, or the, um, <laughs> I said that back, backwards. Um, so that as they, they don't, it's not, the long day isn't required for them to grow. Um, now scallions can be grown in the fall because we don't expect them to form the bulb and they do just fine. They're a great fall crop and often they overwinter and, and you can start eating them in early spring. Um, there are what's called day neutral plants. They're not affected. Um, most of your cucurbits like squash and cucumbers, um, they're more, uh, tomatoes, corn, they're more affected by how cold it is outside, uh, you know, and how warm it is or how cold it is rather than uh, how long the days are. Um, so, you know, 
other things that you might be familiar with that are short day plants are like mums. Uh, that's why mums are always popular to put in the fall because they start to flower as fall up as the days get shorter. Same with Christmas cactuses, poinsettias. Uh, those are plants that are traditionally grown in, in the fall and winter because they, the shorter days actually uh, cause them to start thinking about blooming and growing. So just a little bit of a background there. Now in Michigan, our as I mentioned before, our average first frost date is October 7th through 14th. Um, so when you, you know, have a packet of seeds or, or you know, you're you're looking to say, well, when, I, when should I plant this or when should I plant that? Count back from those dates. Uh, I'm adding time on. I'm starting what I used to maybe do in mid-July. I'm going to be doing in the next few days um, just because I, I'm, I, I'm a little spooked by that early frost we had last year, and I don't want to be caught uh, unprepared for that this year. Um, Non-fruiting plants like greens, you know, it maturity is is relative you know you, you're let you can pick baby lettuce or you can let it form a head you can pick um mustard as tiny little greens or you can let it grow uh so you know it greens are less uh, you can go longer into the fall planting those because you even if they're just a few weeks old you can still um, harvest them um so indoors um you can plant right, you know, right about now or in the next week or so. Um, do plants for the fall, and, and and you can also plant them outdoors if they're in a protected spot. Um, often this time of year, though, there's slugs and bugs. You know, the cabbage worms are out there, and sometimes they can eat up your babies before they even have a chance. So I usually I like I prefer planting those indoors. Um, so, you know, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, um, scallions, head lettuce, kale, uh, even kohlrabi, which is sometimes considered a root crop can be started early. Uh, parsley, uh, it, parsley's not going to be a huge plant by fall because it takes a while to germinate, but it's still, you know, you can still, if you plant a lot of it, you can still cut it and dry it or, or use it in your recipes. Um, so just keep keep in mind that you want to start things that have the shorter maturity dates dates as you look at different varieties some some cabbages may have you know say 48 days and another cabbage might be 75 days so you know you definitely want to go, gonna gonna want to go with one that's more like 48 or 50 something days than um one that's going to take a longer to mature and form ahead um now we are going to start start about start talk about starting seeds indoors in just a couple of minutes. Um, so outdoors in early July, you can, you can direct. So beets and carrots, um, called Robbie. I just put rutabaga in yesterday. So, you know, it's, it's, even though it takes a while to form a head, if you get it in early, you can, they may not be the biggest rutabagas you ever grew, but they're certainly going to be a nice size. Um, and you can also plant more of some things that are starting to get tired. Um, sometimes your summer squash will be, you know, the borers will get in them. And it's, it's really great in early July to start some more because most of your summer squash are 50, 60 days. So they're going to come in under the wire with a nice crop in the fall. And sometimes the borers life cycle is such that they probably will be missed uh, they'll miss the whole second planting of squash that you do. Same for green beans. Um, re, like I said, bush green beans tend to uh, form a crop all at once. They come in fast, you know, and you'll get a few after your main pickings. But, you know, they're, they're designed to be harvested all at once um, as opposed to uh, pole beans, which produce over a longer period of time. So bush green beans, we've got time to put those in. You can plant some scallions. Uh, one of the herbs is dill. Dill will still come up and grow. Uh, always checking to get the shortest maturity base dates. Um, in early August, you still have time to direct. So almost every green, um, 
in quick growing roots like radishes and baby turnips. Uh, beets and carrots and daikon rad radishes tend to have a little bit longer growing period, but I, I put them there because it can still be done. You may have to employ some kind of a uh, protection for them if, it do, if you do get a really early frost. Or um, you can also, you know, like I said, make sure you get the earliest um, maturing types. Um, some carrots are better. They, they say they're best planted in the fall. They just tend to do better. Um, daikon radishes, if you're not familiar, are uh, um, as, as opposed to the little, what we most commonly associate radishes to be the little round red ones. Uh, daikons are a, a, a large root that's um, white or green or red in the middle. And they're, they're look, used a lot for cooking and, and marinating and um, now the little, the regular small red radishes that I spoke about come in much earlier. Sometimes those by 28, 30 days, you've got a pickable crop. So you can still definitely get those in. Um, there's some fast growing turnips. And if you don't think you like turnips, try a fall grown turnip because it might change your mind completely about them. Um, uh, they're great cubed and put it you can cube them and put them in the oven or even just half them if they're small and roast them they're heavenly <laughs> so a little plug for the often misunderstood turnip um, also in september and october here if you are planting garlic that is the time um, uh, somebody in the comments is asking if you can plant them sooner than in september and october um, let me pull this out so I can see. Um, I think if you, if the bags of garlic bulbs that you're, that are sprouting, Chris, um, if they are the soft neck garlic that you often find in the grocery store, uh, they probably won't overwinter well here. Um, if they're hard neck garlic and hard neck can be, um, uh, you know it's a hard neck if it's got a central stem coming out of the middle that's kind of hard and um, it, it, they, they usually have fewer cloves but bigger cloves. So um, you can you can always experiment though and you, you know put it put in your garlic um, you know if you have some sprouted that you bought at the store. Uh, if you bought them at, if you bought them at the store they're probably not hard necked but that's not for sure. If you bought them at a farmer's market, a local farmer's market, then possibly um, they could be a hard neck garlic. Um, but definitely um, check into that before you plant them because hard neck garlics are much more hardy and better for the north. Um, so I'm kind of going to go over again um, some of the candidates. Um, these are, you know, like I said, there's two types. There's, there's things that are frost hardy that, you, that will grow on into the winter. And then there's short season warm crops, which we'll cover in the next slide. Um, so I, I don't really think I need to reset, restate all of these, except for I didn't really cover herbs. herbs. Um, cilantro is one that does not like hot weather. So if you planted cilantro this spring, it's probably you know, went to seed. So fall's a great time to start cilantro again and let it uh, mature in the um, cool weather. Parsley, as I mentioned before, if, if you want to start parsley, plant a lot of it and let it, uh, in, in, you know, it's not going to get as big as the parsley you plant in the spring. But one thing about parsley is it will uh, overwinter and come back and form seed the next year. Now, if you're not interested in saving seed, you will get, you can plant those early, it'll come up really early and you can start using it right away. Um, if you're interested in saving it for seed, just let it go to seed and it'll um, reward you with par parsley seed. Parsley is a, one of the crops that it's better to have fresher seed. So, you know, you can always save your, your parsley seed for the next year. Um, short season peas, 
you know, like, like cabbages and other things, some are shorter than others. So make sure what you're, you know, there's snap peas, which are kind of like a green bean, you eat the shell and all. And then there's shelling peas, which are the, I guess you, or they're sometimes called English peas, where you take the peas out of the shell because the shell is hard or snow peas, which are the flat ones that you pick before the pea starts to form in the pod. And um, so all of those things, there are short season varieties that you can plant and get going. Um, one of the problems with peas and some of the other cool weather crops is that they, um, they um, don't, um, they don't, uh, germinate well in the heat. So you can take the pea seeds and put them between some uh, damp paper towels for a couple of days or soak them ahead of time and then put them into the paper towels until they just start to form a little, um, I guess you could say, I call it a little snout. You know, it looks like a little nose starts to appear out of them um, and then plant them. And that, that might increase your... Uh, your heart or your you know success with your pea seeds is by sprouting pre-sprouting them before you put them in the ground um we talked about garlic calendula is another flower it's a kind of a daisy like flower usually comes in shades of orange and yellow but you're finding more reds and stuff as people kind of play around with their genetics a little bit uh calendula is uh does love to be cool weather so planting uh, you can plant it in early spring, much earlier than most flowers. Um, it kind of peters out during the summer, and then you can plant a fresh batch for fall. Um, Calendia flowers especially are used a lot in um, making homemade herbal uh, products like tinctures and salves. It's very soothing to the skin. Um, potatoes. I, you can experiment with them if you have if you dug up your seed potatoes um, in the spring and you have some little ones that are maybe an inch inch and a half you know less than a golf ball size that you saved um, you can always plant those in the fall and mulch them and you'll those you get some very early potatoes the next spring um, this is assuming that your winter isn't super, super damp and, and there's not a lot of uh, water, you know, standing in your garden. Seed potatoes do not like to grow in, in very, very wet conditions. So they, you know, so you could, it's an experiment. If you have them and you're just going to throw them away or not use them, then, then go ahead and try to plant them and mark them, mark everything um, for the next year, because it's really easy to forget what you've planted. Um, especially if you wait a whole winter to, um, to harvest them. Um, now, fast growing warm weather crops that you can sneak in by planting now are uh, amaranth or, or is a great green. Um, it for, you know, grain amaranth, um, it might not form a big seed head by the end of summer, but it definitely, and it, it, it very well might, it just depends on the type. Uh, but amaranth grown for greens um, is fast growing. It loves the summer. It'll, it'll germinate just fine right now. Um, and it can be used as a cooked green, um, sometimes a salad green. They're kind of tough and hairy. Some of the varieties are and some aren't. So some are okay as a salad green, but most of the people cook them. Um, roots, uh, all, all, uh, you know, I say warm weather crop, but they're all, they can, the one thing that's different about beets and carrots, uh, especially, and scallions is they can be grown all summer long. You can start them and succession sow them. You can start them early spring, even as early as middle of April, uh, if conditions are right. And um, you can sow them every week or two or three or four or once a month and keep, keep a succession going. And like I said, some point in July, um, the chances of them reaching harvestable size before they stop growing um, lessens. Uh, but usually by mid, you know, early and mid July, you can still get a nice beet and carrot um, crop. Um, the rest of the things on that list, um, the daikons and radishes and turnips, they all grow, you know, well in the fall. Um, 
so they're not technically a warm weather crop. Um, there's still plenty of time to get basil, borage, chervil, dill. Um, if you start them now, uh, basil loves the hot weather. Um, dill grows rampantly. Um, borage is maybe not as well known. Uh, but it's it's kind of has a cauliflower flavor to it, especially in their flowers are used a lot in because they're an edible flower and they're a beautiful blue. Um, alyssum and nasturtiums, you still you can still get them going now and, and get a crop by fall. Um, summer squash, as we mentioned before, cucumbers, if you get quick maturing types, um, they're going to give you a nice crop before the frost hits and snap beans as well. I just have a couple of slides of pictures. Uh, sometimes we forget that not everybody is familiar or didn't grow up eating some of these things. So, um, you know, I kind of thought I'd just do a visual. Um, if we've got mustard greens, uh, there's lots of different sizes and shapes and, and, and some are green and some are more yellow and, but some are red, but, you know, mustard greens are a pungent crop. They tend to have a little bit more of a, of that what what you might say uh you know same kind of flavor profile a little more sulfur in them um so people who don't think they like mustard greens often will like a fall grown mustard because they're not as as strong flavored um another thing some people aren't familiar with are kohlrabi uh they're kind of like a little ufo uh that grows on in your garden um they're they're kind of a halfway between a root crop and a and a uh, above ground crop because their their tuber or bulb is actually right on top of the soil they don't grow down into the soil um, they have kind of a cabbagey flavor um, so they're in and I guess most of my life I had them um, I just chop them up and put them in salads, they either grated them or cubed them and put them in salads or sliced them. Uh, but I've re recently got into roasting them and they're really, really good. Similar flavor profile to turnips and things like that. But um, so if you haven't tried some of these, fall is a great time to, to experiment. Um, daikon radish, uh, the picture here is shows kind of a round one, but some of them are very long, um, tapered like a carrot, only sometimes much larger than a carrot. Uh, yes, bor borage flowers do taste cucumbery. Um, and the cucumber, uh, she also mentions kohlrabi. Um, yeah, peel and eat raw. But like I said, you know, I've, I've you know, I've kind of become enamored of roasting them as well. Um, so let's see, most of these are pretty familiar to people. Arugula, a lot of people think of as, as something they get at a, you know, in a, maybe an Italian restaurant or some people like it on top of pizza, just raw. Um, it's got a different flavor, um, not really mustardy, but stronger. It has a more definite flavor than say lettuce. Um, so most people either like it or they don't. But like I, I kind of enjoy it on any in a kind of a put raw on a pasta dish. But eating it in a um, eating it in a salad I, is not my favorite way. But other people just adore it. You know, they'll they just love the flavor. It's like anything else. To each, you know, some people like it and some people don't. Um, and chard. Somebody, I have a question of what do you do with chard? Chard is basically beets beet greens and chard are the same thing they're the same plant um chard has is grown for its leaves whereas beets uh, have been selected to have an you know an, an enlarged root which and you can eat uh beet greens as well as the beet root and and either you know they're all great so with chard you can have it fresh in a salad you can, yeah, anything you do with spinach, as Libby says, um, you can stir fry it, you can steam it, you can, um, I mean, it's going to have the most vitamins and minerals raw, but it definitely can be used as a cook green. Um, uh, one thing you can do with almost any green, uh, if you are kind of don't know what to do with them and you want to cook them is to um, kind of 
loosely chop them and you don't have to chop them much because they shrink down when you cook them is to first chop up some onion and get that sauteing uh throw you know a couple cloves of garlic throw that in get those to just where they're translucent and soft and then just throw your whole mess of greens right on top of it and the green you know that this is good for spinach or beet greens or chard or um any of the cookable greens turnips greens mustards and just let it cook down and uh, just for a couple of minutes and and the the greens will become much smaller so you always chop a lot more than you think you're going to eat because it, it kind of as soon as they put or hit the heat they wilt um but yeah the and you can throw a little vinegar on there if you like that a little balsamic vinegar so yeah just quick 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 cook in a frying pan with some onions and garlic it's heavenly um chinese cabbage um uh, is something that's also called napa cabbage um it can be cooked in um it can be just sliced rough rough chopped or sliced and put in a stir fry you can eat it raw um but i think uh, it also can be fermented uh better you know uh, when you, someone thinks of kimchi, um, that's usually the kind of cabbage that is used to make kimchi, which is a fermented product. It's, I can't say it's similar to, um, I can't say it's similar to the, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. Um, oh, kimchi is not similar to kraut other than the fact that they're both fermented because kimchi usually has quite a bit of uh, ground pepper powder and you know from red peppers hot peppers and it tends to be a bit spicy if you make your own kimchi you can adjust that spice level to almost nothing if you want to and still have a great product pak choy is a little head forming green um, you can you can chop it up and put it in a stir fry you can when they're babies you can um, just slice slice them in half whole and put them under the broiler uh, with it, maybe coat them in oil, a little bit of oil before you cook them. Um, so they're great roasted. Um, Andive is, is, you know, a little bit more of a, um, so grows very similar to lettuce. Um, and again, in the fall, it's going to be a little bit milder. Um, it's a Sometimes it's related to chicory and it can have a little bit of bitterness. So um, you can experiment with different varieties because uh, different variety of chicory and on I do have a definite definite spicy uh, range of spiciness in them um, and then cabbage cauliflower broccoli most of us are um, pretty familiar with those um, back to the garlic um, this is a picture of hard neck garlic uh, this is one that's grown in your you know northern gardens as a rule um, so in the ones that you buy in a store that come, you know, maybe are grown in California, um, sometimes China, um, you can um, always tell a Chinese garlic um, because you see that little bit of roots there. Um, it's, you're not, they're not supposed to import them into the U.S. with roots attached. So they will literally scoop out scoop off the roots so that it's a little smooth little concave area there um and you know some people feel that you know they just want to grow american produced produce um, for whatever reason um, some people worry about the pollution in china so you know I, i'm not making a statement either way but um it is if you find Hard or garlic of any kind with the root still attached, you can be pretty sure that they were grown in the USA. Um, the picture to the left is is uh, called, you know, the common name is um, Egyptian walking onions. Uh, they they're called they're one of a group of top set onions where they actually gr grow a cluster of little bulbs at the top of the uh, instead of a seed head, they grow the little bulbs. As the bulbs grow, the weight bends it down and to the ground, and then the bulbs root into the ground, and they literally can move around that way. Um, so they call them walking onions. Uh, they're, they, they're not, you don't have to worry about them taking over or becoming invasive because 
they don't move that fast, you know, just one clump a year, so to speak. And, and so they're in, they're easy to dig up and share with others. You can share the little top sets with others. I I usually have more than I need and bring them in here to the library. So you can always check in the fall or early, early spring and see if we have them in the seed library. But these are all things that you can plant in the fall. Um, starting seeds indoors is, is pretty much the same uh, as starting seeds at any other time. But if you're new to seed starting, I have a one slide little, um, you know, thing here to kind of, you know, get you going on it. Um, because a lot of the crops that like cool weather don't want to germinate well outside or like I said the bugs and critters can you know they're always waiting for a nice little uh seed that, or a nice little start to come up from the from the seed so that they can eat it or defile it in some ways so you can um start a lot of your seeds indoors just to get them going um so most you can use a variety of, of seed starting mechanisms, be little pots. You can, you know, I, I got a picture here where people are using all kinds of things. They're using deli containers and, and a little sterilite box. You just, you do need to have drainage though. So if you're going to use something like a cat litter box or a, or a little shoe box or something, you do need to dr drill holes in the bottom so that they will drain. Um, you know, you, you know, your seedlings are at the right consistency for moisture if I've heard it described a couple of ways but one I kind of like is if it's like the consistency of a of a chocolate cake or a cake you know it, it's moist but it's not wet um, and so uh, you you want to keep them moist but not soggy because those little seeds can just drown if it's too much water um, adequate light is super important if you don't have a really bright window um, you want to use fluorescent or LED lights. And on the picture on the bottom left, you can see, see how stretched out those little seedlings are, how long they are. That's not going to make a good plant. Um, the lights should be just a couple of inches away from the top. You know, they, they should never have had to stretch for that light. It looks like in that picture, um, that they kept the light up because of that dome. Um, you're, you're just better off growing things that are similarly sized so you don't have to put the light up so high. Um, the middle, the middle uh, slide is much more of what you wanna see. You wanna see nice compact growth, not stretching. Um, and you know, they're not gonna be in there all that long. It's, it's, you're not waiting for you know, frost free like you are in the spring. You're, 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 as soon as they get to be a decent size, you can plant them. Um, on the far right, it's just a nice um, little lettuce plant that's ready to plant outside. You know, it's got a few, it's got a few true leaves and so it's ready to go. Um, when you put your plants outside, protect them. They haven't, if they've been under lights, they are in a, in a window with some glass between them, they're not going to be used to sun and wind. So, you know, you're going to have to, the best thing to do is start taking them outdoors for a few days in their containers and bring them in uh, if the weather threatens and kind of get them what it's called hardened off. So get them used to being outside. Uh, wind and full sun can, can be really hard on a tender little seedling. Um, if you have any other questions, I think on our LTPL Grows site, we have a previous program on seed starting that is loaded up there. It's, it's just the PowerPoint. I, it might just be the PowerPoint or it might be the full program. I don't remember, but you can kind of um, get a little review on seed starting. You can also, we also have tons of books in the library on all these subjects. So please come in and see me and I can send you home with some information if you need it. Um, so caring for a fall garden isn't much different than in the spring. You've got to um, weed and prepare the soil, get it ready for your planting. Um, sometimes if you've been growing other crops and you have access to it, adding some compost to it would ki to kind of, you know, re-nourish the soil. There's a lot of other things you can put in, in too that are um, 
great for, you know, some, uh, a lot of people are concerned with remineralization of the soil, adding more, um, adding more um, of trace minerals that you don't usually find in a standard fertilizer. So, you know, if you want to get into reading about that, there's lots of, you know, everything from rock phosphate to some forms, different forms of calcium to add to your soil um, to strengthen your plants. Uh, keep your newly planted seeds and transplant watered and protected. As I was mentioning before, you, you know, you've got it. There's all kinds of critters out there that w would like, once they get to a certain size, you know, they're a little bit, um, more sturdy. So if something chomps a leaf, you know, they haven't chomped the whole plant, they've just chomped one leaf. Um, keep in mind that, you know, we can still get some super hot weather in July and August and even September. So, you know, if you, um, if they look like they're stressed, there's, you know, we're going to go over a couple of strategies, but, you know, putting um, a little shade over them at the hottest part of the day, um, mulching them helps. Um, you can use uh, dried up grass clippings. Don't put fresh grass clippings on your gardens because they often heat up, especially if they're put on deeply and they can actually cook your plants. So you want to dry your, pick up, you know, if, you, if you're using grass clippings from your lawn, um, make sure they kind of a dried for, a, until, you know, until you rake them up or if you put, if you collect them in a basket on the mower, um, kind of spread them out somewhere and let them dry before you put them on your plants. But they make excellent, um, excellent uh, mulch, especially for fine things that, you know, you can't put a big clumpy mulch on something that's, you know, a tiny little lettuce seedling, but you can tuck some nice grass clippings up there. Um, the one caveat I say is if you have a treated lawn, um, don't use your clippings. If you lose Chemlon or something like that, um, the, the root, the, the products that they use on the lawn to keep uh, broadleaf um, weeds from growing will also kill your plants. So you don't, you just use, um, if you have a lawn like mine, that's basically feral, then you can go ahead and use your grass clippings. Um, so let's see. And again, water, make sure they're watered if it's a dry day and um, keep them growing. If, if they get a good start and grow strong, then they're going to keep growing rapidly and, and not get set back. Um, now there's different kinds of crops. Even the hardy ones can take various degrees of winter, I guess, and, and fall. Um, some, some crops will survive, um, unprotected until it gets down into the lower 20s you know if it's if it's uh, 28 29 30 degrees they're probably going to come through it just fine um once they get started into the lower 20s then then they're going to start to you know they're going to possibly freeze sol solid and they're um where they may survive their eating quality might start to suffer um and so most of the p ones on this list will survive um, a moderate, a light to moderate frost. Um, I have potatoes on there. Um, usually by fall, the potato vines have died back anyway, um, but you can still continue um, or they will die. The potato vines will die in a frost, but you can still continue to dig them for a while longer. Um, but clean off the, you know, the dead vines and get them out of there. And you can still continue to dig your potatoes, um, you know, for at least for a while. Um, and root crops, um, some root crops can be basically kept in your garden all winter. Um, we're going to talk about season, you know, well, this is season extenders, but I'm going to show you a couple of strategies for that. Um, but some people, rather than put their things in a refrigerator or if they don't have a root cellar, you can heavily mulch your um, um, carrots, turnips, beets, rutabagas, parsnips. And I mean, when I say heavily mulch, I mean literally one or two feet of, of or even a whole straw bale. Um, and, and, uh, then you, if, if winter is here, you know, you have to cover it with a tarp. Um, that's basically so that, you know, to keep snow off of the, 
so you don't have to dig through so much snow to get to your plants. Um, that's not the easy way to do it. Um, it's definitely easier to go get some out of your fridge or if you have a root cellar or a cold basement, cool area of the basement that you can keep them in um, or a unheated garage that doesn't usually get below freezing, you know, an attached garage to a house. Sometimes people have good luck. Um, so if you can't store them in any of those ways, this is one way you can do it. Um, and, but yeah, you know, like I said, if you're just getting ready for dinner and you say, Oh, I want some rutabagas and you think, Oh my gosh, I have to go out there and uncover all that stuff and dig down, you know, it's a pain, but it's also a survival thing. You know, if, you know, for people who are worried about um, what to do if, uh, you know, somehow if the, you know, what hits the fan and, and you don't have access to food, you know, it's, it is a strategy for um, keeping your food alive and preserved until you're ready to eat it. Um, but it's, it's a hard, hard way to do it, but it definitely works. Um, and, you know, a little easier way to do it is a you know, mulch or, or, you know, a mulch and a cold frame or a hoop house and many of these um, and I always put possibly potatoes there because um, the quality of potatoes you know they may survive and grow the next year but how how great they um, will keep in the ground varies from potato to potato and I honestly don't know if you have better luck with russets as opposed to you know, waxy tomatoes, you know, like an early tomato potato, I mean, and so it's, uh, it, it's something you can experiment with. Um, in a, and the last sentence is really important, um, especially right now where people have standing water in there. If that happens in the fall when you're trying to keep your crops out there and they're wet and then they freeze, solid and the, in a, and they free and they stay that way the rest of the winter you, you again it's going to be really hard to get them out of the ground um, they might not be in great great quality when it happens so um, one of the things you can do um, again is have a covered um, thing like which i'm going to talk about in just a moment or um, you can maybe cover them with a tarp um, or just dig them and bring them in before they they're ruined. Um, so these are like mini hoop houses that th these have actual plastic over them, as opposed to a permeable row cover, um, they can be as large or as small as you want, you know, some people have hoop houses they can walk into. Um, and but this this is one that you can make, you know, in, in a typical suburban yard if you so desire and it's basically some pvc pipe that's arced over um and then um the plastic is stapled and both ends to long pieces of a, either a two by two or two by four um and you take the in the and you can actually roll up the plastic and put it down alongside it during the day and then at night you can pull it up over and kind of secure the ends. they just use a clamp on the end to kind of hold everything together uh, on the far right um, they you know it's a little it looks like a prefab hoop house that somebody can buy you might even lay over crawl in there on your hands and knees um, these are all things along with mulch that can keep your garden going for quite some time there is a question about cedar or pine shavings um, as mulch, cedar especially has, you know, is the reason it smells so good is it has cedar oil in it. Um, not all plants react well to that. Some outright can't take it at all. So, you know, you have to be really careful with cedar. Um, your best bet with any of those is to at least compost them for a while. Um, and by compost, I mean just put them somewhere where they can kind of start to decay their some of the oils leach out of them um, and they might be better to use after like if you put them out uh, at one year then the next use them the next year um, if you have um, pet cages and you want to use the the um, the cleanings out of your pet cages if you want to compost though it's really not any much different than 
than using manure from horses or cows or any other kind of manure um, as long as it's composted most of you know if there's any concern about bacteria or anything it's usually broken down by the time you use it but definitely you want to compost most kinds of things like that before you use them but be careful with with highly aromatic um, wood shavings pine again uh, there there's a, also a school of thought that the pine, that the shavings actually take nitrogen out of the soil to uh, to decay uh, you know to help them to break them down um, per current thought on that is that it's minimal um, so you know that's not really a major concern now floating row cover is a little a different kind of a cover it's a little more um, versatile I guess um, and one thing I wanted to mention about the, the plastic covering is make sure that you do pull it off during the day, especially if, if, if it's a sunny day, because uh, you can uh, even a little bit of sun, even if it's a 30 degree day, the sun can create in a plastic little hoop house, uh, you know, it's so hot that it can kill your plants. You know, it's the greenhouse effect, I guess. Now, floating row cover, on the other hand, is a spun bonded material that's that air and water can permeate. So it's it's it provides a several degrees of uh, protection against frost. It keeps bugs off your plants. Um, it'll shade the plants slightly. Um, it's pretty good, though. I mean, it's it's made to be used over plants. So it's surprisingly most of the sunlight does get through. Um, so, you know, it's, it's protection against the frost for some of these things like lettuce and stuff that don't need as much protection, but you want to keep it in good condition as long as you can. So these, these little hoop houses, uh, you know, it's a, probably the same thing way as you use the, it's lighter, it's easier to handle than plastic. So instead of having to roll it off and put it over, you know, you can, um, just kind of drape it over the little hoops and you can fold it up during the day or leave it hanging somewhere so it can dry out if you want to take it completely off. But the glory of it is, is you don't have to take it completely off. You can just leave it on you don't, and it won't heat up in there and kill your plants like plastic will. Plastic's going to give you more, probably more protection but for a lot of these plants, they don't need much. They just might need a little bit to get up through the night. You know, the difference between a 22 degree night and a 30 degree night for some of these things. Um, there's cold frames too. Um, cold frames can be, you can buy prefab ones at the store or order them. Or you can make your own sometimes by digging down and putting windows over it. Uh, same, you know, it's a great way to use up old windows rather than putting them in a landfill. But the same um, warning applies as as does for plastic is that you have to make sure they open during the day. Um, if you look closely to the um, picture on the upper right, you see a, in the in the uh, there's a little um, hydraulic lift. Yeah. Uh, that you can buy these um, and hook them on and they actually expand as the, as the cold frame heats up and, they, and it pushes the door open. Uh, those are really handy to have, especially if you uh, have to go to work during the day and you're not home. Um, there's, it's a terrible feeling to get to work and realize that you haven't opened your cold, cold frame before you left. And um, don't ask me how I know that. Um, so you know, that that's one strategy you can use. They, they're they not, unless they've come down in price, they're not particularly cheap, but they last for many, many years. So they're a nice little safety precaution to have if you're using, if you're using a cold frame. But cold frames can, you, you one of the advantages of them, if they're permanent or semi-permanent, is you plant right into them. Um, it's not necessarily some something that you move the plants into later. So you kind of have to think about your fall garden if you're going to use a cold frame because you you if you plant the lettuce and everything in it, and um, as soon as a really really cold night start you know start and yeah lettuce and green and root crops and everything but you have to plant them in there from the beginning they don't transplant that great in there. Well, I guess you should you can put transplants in there. I guess I should rephrase that, but um, 
once the plant is mature, you know, it's harder to put it in a cold frame. It's better to start your crops inside of them. Um, this is another uh, example is, is people just, if you know, it kind of depends on what you have. Some people have leftover straw or they have a, you know, inexpensive source for it. Um, and straw is a great uh, cold frame. Uh, you can just put them in a square and the dark jug and the, on the left-hand side is, is just um, dark colored water in what, you know, a, a regular old water jug that you can get, you know, five gallon water jug. Um, during the day that dark water heats up and you can put, you know, dyes in it or whatever, or you can paint the jug black. Um, there's lots of ways you can do it, but that, it, and then at night, that warm water re gently releases uh, and brings up the temperature. Uh, it, so that's another little scheme you can use. Um, now in the upper right-hand corner, it's just using um, straw as a heavy mulch rather than using bales of straw. And that works great. You know, you're, as long as you can keep the ground from freezing, those happen to be carrots. Um, as long as you can keep the ground from freezing, you can, you can pull those carrots well into, you know, late fall and early winter. Um, so that's uh, some little strategy. Oh, one more thing I want to mention is cover crops. We, I touched on it earlier. These are crops that keep your soil from being fallow. They add uh, organic matter to the soil, um, which is always great. You know, the more you can, if you've got clay soil or sandy soil, the more um, uh, uh, organic matter you can get into the soil, the better it's going to retain water and the more nutritious it's going to be. Um, you can, and these cover crops can outcompete the annual weeds. You know, they're, they're the, they, they will slow them down. Uh, they hold the soil in place with their roots. If you happen to have a sloping garden, or if you, if you've got a lot of wind over the winter, if you don't have trees that kind of can block the wind, some people lose a lot of topsoil over the winter. It just blows away. Um, planting a cover crop for the winter, um, can keep that from happening. Um, some cover crops have really deep roots. Um, they take nutrients that are down farther in the soil and pull them up into their leaves. And then when those leaves are broken down and the, you know, those that brings those uh, nutrients up to the surface surface. Um, biofumigant, not many people go this far, but it is true. You can use, uh, there's types of mustards and radish and, and um, turnips and that can be planted that actually um, the roots are so long that they, they go down and, and pull up those nutrients as we mentioned, but it also helps break up hard crop, hard soil um, because that if you leave it there all winter and then in the spring, it will um, start to decay because they, you know, these are things that will probably winter kill. Um, and then in the spring, you dig it all in and um, you've really uh, amended your soil, but plus there are some, um, heebie-jeebies, I guess you call them, of viruses, um, bacteria in the soil that actually are repelled or killed by using members of the brassica family um, as a cover crop. Um, so you use a cover crop anytime an area is not going to be planted. It's not just for the fall. Um, if you have a, you know, there's different crops for different times of the year. Um, for fall, most people um, tend to plant winter rye. Um, it's very winter hardy. It grows like, and looks like grass. Um, so it, and then you have to either turn it over or rototill it in, in the spring, um, that it, and it can be mixed with other cover crops too. But the thing is with it is that it takes a while to break down. So if you can't get in there to get it turned over really early in the spring, the it might not be broken down enough to plant in to plant seeds, but um, sometimes you can. It's good for things like um, um, transplants for tomatoes and things like that, because by the time you get around to late May, it's probably broken down enough. You can plant your tomatoes there. Um, you can um, plant uh, large seeded things that aren't going to be as intimidated by it, like beans. Uh, things like that that are, you know, 
summer or winter squash, things with large seeds. Now buckwheat or oats, they kill, they winter kill. So um, those are best to use if you want to um, have it all nice and broken down by early spring. So, and, and I talked a little bit tomorrow about the tillage radishes or mustards. Um, they, they're the picture on the lower left, or look, yeah, lower right, I'm sorry, of how those roots go down in there and break up that soil and, and pull those nutrients up to the surface. And the middle one, I believe, is buckwheat. Um, yeah, that's buckwheat growing there. Um, buckwheat's very tender, so um, it, it's going to winter kill. You dig it in, and it'll be all nice and broken down by spring. Um, so we're getting to the end here. So I want to talk a little bit about our seed library for those who aren't familiar. Um, so we've got... Um, a seed library, if you aren't into going into buildings yet, if you email me, I can put seeds in our curbside pickup for you. Um, we have an email list. I send um, reminders about upcoming programs. Uh, if you want to be put on that list, um, you can, same email, just write me a letter and say, hey, put me on your, your mailing list. Um, it, you get stuff maybe once a month and in the winter probably you go some time without getting any so it kind of depends on the time of year but you definitely won't be bombarded with emails from me i i don't i try not to send them too often um we do have a facebook page our ltpl grows facebook page um you can click that link or or just um go to um facebook and look us up and find us Again, I post gardening tips, uh, upcoming programs and thing on that site too. So if you're on Facebook, definitely give us a follow us and like us and all of that. Um, most of these seeds, uh, again, it's subject to a limited supply, but most of these things are in the um, seed library right now. Uh, these are all different kinds of, most of these are plants that are Going, if you plant them now or soon, they're going to come in just fine. Or we've got some lot, a lot of winter hardy um, plants in there. One, one thing I wanted to mention was the mustard green and snow. They call it that because it sometimes stays green all winter and, and definitely starts coming up again in the spring really early. So that's it. Um, those were donated by um, a seed saving group that, that is really trying to get more unusual, or I shouldn't say unusual because there's nothing unusual about mustard, but not a lot of people are familiar with it. So get get you to try these. Um, so the, you know, again, you can come in and take a look. If I'm here, I'm usually here on Monday evening, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, most days, you can always give a email and find, you know, make sure I'm going to be here. I'm happy to walk you through the seed library and the seeds and familiar, you know, help you out with your choices. Um, we also are part of the Michigan Seed Library Network. Um, it's a uh, kind of an umbrella group for our seed libraries in the state of Michigan. Um, we have every year, starting this year, is our One Seat, One State initiative. So we all kind of get together and grow the same plant. It's kind of a fun thing to do. This year, our selection is provider bush green bean. And it's a 50 to 55 day green bean. So you can plant it now and still get a, um, a crop this, this year before it even gets cold. Um, and we do have, I have plenty of those available in, in our seed library. So um, if you have any questions, um, you can either put it in the chat. If you wanna unmute yourself and ask, that's fine too. Um, I'll give a couple minutes for any questions, answers. Um, if not, um, we will be putting this program on the website. If you go to our, um, our, li our library website, ltpl.org, um, and, and you'll find under attend, there's a, you'll, you'll see 
Lyon Township Public Li or LTPL grows, and that there you will find handouts. You'll find out. You'll find um, some of the uh, programs that we've presented. You'll find there. You can watch them. And like I said, sometimes it's just a PowerPoint. Sometimes it's the whole program with talking and everything. So, you know, you can click on those. And this winter, when you might have more time, you can kind of get ready for spring by watching those. Um, so I just also wanted to mention that in um, July and August, we are going to be a, doing a children's uh, trio of gardening programs. Um, the first one is on July 8th, I believe, and it's Jack and the Beanstalk. Um, and the second one will be on uh, Good Bugs, Bad Bugs. And that's a, toward the end of July. I, I, I don't, you know, this is all on our website. And, um, and then the first, the last one is in early um, August, and that's going to be on composting. And um, so composting is, they will be getting a little compost bucket and that the children will be, and this is kind of aimed toward grade school children. It's not really meant for very young children or, you know, but you know, we're, we're happy if you want to um, come in and, and sign up for it. Um, but it, you do need to register on our website. If you go to our calendar on our website, you'll be able to find these programs. Um, yes, yeah, purchase cover crop seed. Winter wheat uh, and winter rye are very usually available at farm stores. Um, buckwheat and... and um, is is one you might not find um but you can certainly order it from almost every um seed company from johnny's to pine tree to um, fedco to uh um true uh true leaf all of them they they all have usually sell some cover crops um of course you have to pay shipping but um and the more you buy, the less expensive it is. So you, it's always a great thing to go in on with a friend too, because the more you in, but yeah, some of the local feed stores will um, carry these things. And, and sometimes they want you to buy a whole bag of it. And some of them will, will break it up into smaller portions for the home gardeners. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions. So I think we're going to um, end it here. And again, if you think of something later, feel free to e email me, um, pquackenbush at ltpl.org, um, or give a call. And um, if I'm here, I'll certainly happy to talk to you by phone. Um, you know, you can just look up on the library website for various ways to uh, get a hold of us. So thank you very much for attending. Um, I'm Look forward to seeing you at the next gardening program. We have a couple ideas other than the children's programs. We don't have anything planned, but um, definitely uh, hope to see you soon. And for all the thank yous, you're welcome. I'm glad to have you with us. <laughs>